everybody! Hey, everybody again! Welcome to the next part of Glasgow's Rise to Power. This one called Visions of the Prophet. It takes place right after Glasgow's mysterious disappearance on Armageddon. After leaving Armageddon, Glasgow was not idle. He did not look upon that campaign as a defeat, but more as a necessary stumble that was part of a larger journey. For a master plan had been revealed to Glasgow by Gork and Mork. Now the warlord saw clearly that Armageddon was not the end. It was only the beginning. Clarity of vision. If the Imperium made one huge mistake following the Second War for Armageddon, it was in not immediately pursuing Glasgow with all their strength and available resources. Yarek recommended hunting him down, but few heeded the battle-proven commissar. In truth, the Imperium's high command on Armageddon presumed that the orc warlord that had come out of nowhere to ravage their planet either was dead, or if he had survived the battle, would be washed up nothing. He might live for some time as a recluse, but if he attempted to gather more orcs about him, he would doubtless be slain as a failure. But nothing could be further from the truth. After losing a major battle, orcs will often depose their failed leader. The first step on the downward spiral to true anarchy. It is true that Early on, after his escape, Grasgul did have to remind some tribes of his greatness by defeating his challengers in various horrific fashions. However, the warlord regained his followers' full support, not just with his triumphal acts of violence, but through his words. What the orc gods had revealed to Grasgul, or rather, what Glasgow said they revealed to him was that in order to destroy your foe, you must first know him. To the orcs, such an idea was both radical and profound. This meant that, for Glasgow, the whole invasion of Armageddon was merely a way to test the waters, an experiment if you will, to learn how the Imperium would react against a massive invasion. The swift space marine strikes and the grinding attrition of the human warriors had indeed been eye-openers from an orc isolated on the world of Urk. Now, Glasgow had learned what he had needed to know about the Imperium strategies. It was time to regroup to gather new armies, to rebuild and restore the WAG until it had strength enough to menace entire star systems. <laughs> Next, onwards to Golgotha. Most of Glasgow's forces had been left behind on Armageddon. Only a score of his most trusted mobs were with Glasgow when he landed in the heart of what was notorious orc territory, the world of Golgotha. In ages past, the subsector had been heavily colonized by mankind, but since then it had passed through the grasp of various races until it was ultimately conquered by the orcs. That wag, however, had run out of impetus long ago, leaving behind many desperate and interfeuding tribes. Just like on Urk, Grasgol began subjugating the Greenskins. At first he clubbed bosses and gained new mobs one at a time, but news travels fast when orcs begin to get excited. Whether it was due to the tremendous power of his adamantium skull headbutts, or the orcish wisdom he received went from his visions from Gork and Mork and maybe Bork. Soon, whole tribes were seeking out this new warlord. Thus began decades of long rebuilding. Carefully, Glasgow balanced marshalling the growing numbers of his armies 
and the exponential log energy alongside the need to keep a low profile for the time being. Gork and Mark and Bork had advised him that he did not want to draw outside attention upon himself just yet. Never before had a WAG leader, or any orc for that matter, tried to limit the numbers of orcs he had attracted. But it was all a part of the plan. Before he could take that next step towards ultimate victory, Grasgol would need more than just an enormous army. He would need to have his new tactics perfected and his new weapons working properly. He knew that if his influence expanded too quickly, the plan would not yet have grown ripe. Still, Grasgol launched raids across Ultima Segmentum and beyond. Some were small, consisting of a few mobs. Others were massed assaults capable of overrunning a planet. The attacks hit Imperial outposts or wreaked havoc among shipping lanes. The orcs also ventured into Tau space to smash colonies or attacked other orc territories. Grasgall led some of the expeditions, while for others he put a new corps of sub-commanders to the test. Beyond the value of plunder or even winning the engagements, the raids were done to train new leaders and test his latest strategies. Orcs are never beaten while in battle. We can always come back for another go. Classic orc saying. Next, we're going to deal with teleporter technology. And finally, in the next part, a return to Armageddon. If the Imperium had collected and analyzed their scattered data files, they would have been alarmed by how many recorded attacks Grasgol or armies bearing his insignia had made from year 945 to 996, millennium 41. There was an escalating pattern of violence with many thousands of raids, but the Imperium was a sprawling and bureaucratic being beset by more obvious threats. Only the aged Yarek, who had never ceased in his pursuit of his nemesis, still warned about the impending wag directed by Grasgow. In the year 997 of Millennium 41, Grasgow allied with the most infamous Bad Moon warlord in many millennia, Nazdreg Ug Urgrub. The two leaders field-tested innovative teleporter technology, the ability to send mobs of boys, vehicles, and ultimately even the mountainous gargants from a far distant space hulk down onto a planet. This was tested on the imperial planet of Precipia IV. Only the Dark Angels saved that world from being overrun. But victory was not Grasgol's real goal. His preparations were now over. He was ready to unleash his full force upon the Imperium, exercising a plan 50 years in the making. Next part, a return to Armageddon. Until then, bye. Have fun.